So who's in and who's out of the lineup tonight? Mets bats have been ringing out the last couple of days. 32 hits in the last two games, but not necessarily the people you would have expected. It's taken a village for the Mets to put together a lineup on a day-to-day -day basis, and they're keeping their heads above water and hoping for a foot to heal. At City Field in New York, the New York Mets play the Pittsburgh Pirates. Mets baseball is presented in HD by IOTV. Get the best in HD free with IOTV. And a pleasant good evening, everybody, and welcome to the City Field. I'm Gary Cohen. Ron Darling joins me in just a moment as the Mets play game two of a four-game series against the Pittsburgh Pirates. The Mets won last night, banging out 15 hits. They had 17 the day before, but the big bats in their lineup, missing the news on ike davis today not good ike was examined his bone bruise in his sprained ankle not getting better he's going to have to wear a boot for the next three weeks now he's already not played for the last three three weeks in a boot couple more weeks for conditioning and rehab and you could see a scenario where ike davis wouldn't be ready to return to the mets until almost the all-star break and so it's been up to the guys like justin turner to fill in the blanks well the great thing about justin turner watching him day in and day out it's just outstanding what he's done. Ten extra base hits and 92 at-bats, even more so when you watch him play. He's been outstanding at driving in runs with two outs. Uh, runners in scoring position, he's hitting 444. And even more importantly, when he came up, you were thinking he was the kind of guy that you might platoon. He's hitting 359 against right-handers. Every stat you would like available, he has been so great at. Jason Bay's back in the lineup tonight. Mets are hoping to get him going. David Wright will see the doctor tomorrow. His return is still very much in doubt. Now, as far as the pitching is concerned, the Mets have to work through an injury there. R.A. Dickey, who tore the plantar fascia in his right foot in his last start, pitching on his regular day here tonight. Well, uh, I don't think this hyperbole. I think this is the most important start for a starting pitcher this year for the Mets. There isn't a lot of depth. There isn't a lot of replacement behind R.A. Dickey, and he's going to have to manage that pain and be able to play through it, not only in the pitching department, but also covering the bases and doing all those physical things he'll have to do tonight. 0-4 so far at home. He's going to have to be better. He's going up against James McDonald, who has pitched really well this season. Started slow, but his last six games, 3-1. and one. Long Beach Poly product, product of Chase Utley and Tony Gwynn. So the Mets will be keeping a close eye on R.A. Dickey to see whether that foot holds up tonight as the Mets try to make it three straight wins as they take on the Pirates at City Field. All the action coming your way on SNY.
IO TV. Get the best in HD free with IO TV. Buy Cholula Hot Sauce. Looking for the perfect balance of flavor and heat? Add Cholula to your next meal. The hot sauce with the wooden cap. Buy Verizon 4G LTE built so you can rule the air. Buy New York Lottery. Get the feeling. Play Powerball from the New York Lottery. Hey, you never know. And buy Audi. Tickets for the inaugural soccer match at City Field featuring the national teams from Ecuador and Greece on Tuesday, June 7th at 8 p.m. are on sale now. Call 718-507-TIXX or visit 507-TIXX.com now for your tickets. Here's your Mets upcoming schedule. Remember, all Mets games on SNY are available in HD, presented by IOTV, and you can listen to every Mets game on Sports Radio 66. WFAN night game tomorrow day game Thursday then the Braves are in for the weekend before the Mets embark on a long trip which will see them play three in Milwaukee four in Pittsburgh and three in Atlanta Mets will complete a third of the season and complete the month of May today a summer like day in the city and at the ballpark first pitch Mets and Pirates coming up from City Field. Now that we, we'll dry Keith off and have him ready in a uh, couple of days. By the way, Keith does not get dunked. He does the dunking. <laughs> Here's your Pirates starting lineup brought to you by four. A couple of newcomers. Josh Harrison will make his major league debut playing third base tonight. Dusty Brown, who had a handful of games the last two years with the Red Sox, makes his Pirates debut as Pittsburgh looks for a little different formula tonight against R.A. Dickey. Yeah, the only two numbers as you look at the Verizon numbers for Dickey that you don't like are the hits, 72, and those seven home runs. So far this season. First pitch knuckleball, a strike to Jose Tabata, and we're underway. Tabata 0 for 4 last night. In fact, the top three in the Pittsburgh batting order last night went 0 for 11. Tabata hitting a 246. And with Dickey suffering the, the injury in the 
heel of his right foot. I, I guess the question becomes how will that most affect him and how will we know whether it's bothering him as we watch him early in the game. I can see it right away. I mean usually when he comes out you're talking about pushing off on that back foot and jumping at the hitter. This is much like uh, you would see a guy who's looping the ball. Now but it gets a fastball and takes it the other way to the right field line and he's got a two base hit to open the game. So Jose Tabata with his 10th double of the year to get the Pirates started. Well, the Lexus defense for the Mets, Bay Pagan, Beltran, having them play together is best. Murphy now third base, first career at third base after 196 games in the minor leagues at third base. Tata, Turner, Evans, and Tolley. Um, Gary, really, well, watching R.A. Dickey, it almost looks like when you warm up a pitcher, his first 15 minutes, what he looks like when he's throwing, is how R.A.'s throwing right now. Just really. Not pushing off the lot, just really trying to use his arm more to throw the ball in. And Josh Harrison takes his first major league at bat. Harrison just called up yesterday when a couple of Pirates were placed on the disabled list. He had been hot before being called up. In fact, he had a five for five game on Saturday for Indianapolis. 23 years old out of the University of Cincinnati. And he bounces one foul, and it's 0 2. Harrison has some big league bloodlines. His uncle. Is John Shelby. I played against T Bone, John Shelby's nickname, when he was with the Rochester Red Wings. Of course, made his mark with the Orioles early and then had a catch against the Mets in 88 that we rather forget. As a Dodger, of course. And Harrison pokes the knuckleball foul. And it's still 0 2. Hard for a young guy to get his first game. Well, I was, right against I was the just thinking, welcome, welcome to the big leagues, kid. <laughs> We're going to face a knuckleballer tonight. Andrew McCutcheon, the best hitter on the Pirates team, is waiting on deck. Come on! Hey, Gary, this is not without precedent. There's a lot of times over the course of a career, I can even think about my own career. Where you don't feel 100%, so you kind of make sure you're not exerting too much energy, and every pitch counts. Try to make every pitch a strike. Hi, Harry. Well, Dickey had the one bad first inning in Houston, but generally he is the king of the first inning. Trying to work around a leadoff double here, and Harrison just misses the bag, a foul ball. Harrison has hit every place he has gone. Uh, he sustained some injuries through the minor leagues that's kept him uh, from being able to play a full year. But uh, people rave about his ability to hit line drive. One of those guys who doesn't have much power, doesn't have much speed, but just hits. Kind of a, a Jeff Keppinger type. Tejada in to talk to Dickey. Tejada has been making an effort to keep top of the close at second base. It's like Barnes, yeah. you know, guys like that. Big hole on the left side of the infield for Harrison, with Murphy playing the line and Tejada shading the runner. And it's hit right at Tejada. He'll let Tabata go and throws out Harrison for the first down. So Tabata is now at third with one away. And Andrew McCutcheon will try and get him in. Boy, that was good all the way around. Uh, Tejada made a nice choice. Uh, the base runner is going to be right in his line to take a chance to go to third base. So he prudently threw to first. And Tabata knows where Tejada is. The ball's to his left. He proceeds to third base. I think that was just good all the way around. So now McCutcheon will try and get the first run in. 0 for 3 last night. Hitting a 253. 27 runs batted in. Second on the Pirates. And he hits the first pitch in the air down the right field side, and that'll go foul. Andrew McCutcheon just started to blossom as a budding big league star. Now, Gary, you look at him and say to yourself, boy, you know, not very tall, but uh, if you saw him, he's kind of like uh, Jose Reyes. If you see him in person, taller than you think, much stronger than you think. Already has nine home runs this year as that knuckleball floated wide. I guess we are seeing him in person. I mean, seeing him up close. Yes, I understood what you meant. <laughs> well, Reyes is a legitimate six foot two. McCutch is not quite that big, but he's very built very solidly. Neil Walker waiting on deck. You know McCutcheon's built like? He's built like those uh, shutdown cornerbacks mm -hmm. in the NFL. 
It's funny, I was going to say that about Josh Harrison, the guy who preceded him, who's like 5'8, 185. Of course, if you're playing in the Steel City, having, uh, you know, football type players doesn't hurt. <laughs> That's right. Well, you know, for, for Pittsburgh, um, you know, they were able to max out with Nate McLeod, who they got, who they traded because McCutcheon was ready to play. McLeod hasn't done a lot in Atlanta. In fact, it's on the disabled list right now. Yeah, they got Charlie Morton back in that deal, and he certainly has started to blossom. High knuckleball swung through by McCutcheon, three and two. McCutcheon to me in last night's at bat against Dylan G, first time up was trying to go to right field. And you can see that swing almost looking like he's trying to go to right field, which is a good attack against the knuckleball pitcher. That's the only time he hit a fair ball last night with a line drive to right his first time up. Here's a 3 2, and the knuckleball strikes him out. So Dickey, with a runner at third and one out of strikeout situation, comes from behind to fan McCutcheon. Well, that's his best one, and we've talked about it all year long. When he has that knuckleball turning away from the right hander, starting in the middle of the plate, and taking that one and a half turn out to the outside corner, that's his better one. Mercedes Benz Ultramo brought to you by your tri state dealers on the web at searchmercedes.com. So he's Neil Walker. One for four last night, switch hitter. Hitting just 231 as a right hand batter. And he takes a strike and, like many switch hitters, chooses to bat right handed against the right handed knuckleballer, even though his average is higher from the left side. Walker, I was very impressed with him last night. Remember, he's the one that hit the ball to that Willie Harris made the great play on. In fact, he had a couple of terrific plays made against him. One by Harris and then the one by Angel Pagan out in deep right center field. He was looking at three hits there today. Got only one to show for it. Angel Delta keep climbing overhead camera. He's almost got that stance. Unlike a hitter, the stance is like you would take a stance in slow pitch softball. Kind of feet together and winding up. Nicky ahead 0-2. And the knuckleball grounded slowly. Murphy with his first chance and the throw on target. And he gets Walker the strand top of that third. So Dickey gets around the leadoff double, and the Mets come to bat with no score. Angel Pagan leading off tonight. Jose Reyes away for the second straight day on the bereavement list. And there's your Mets starting lineup brought to you by Geico. Pagan leads off for the first time this year. McDonald falls behind him 2 0. Oh. James McDonald making his 11th start of the year. Well, you see his season 3 and 3, but it's changed around in his last six starts. 3 and 1 with a low ERA. You can see the walks to strikeouts almost 2 to 1. 
Got a chance to be a full time starting pitcher when the Dodgers traded him to the Pirates last year. But Gon's been red hot since coming off the DL. Four games. He's gone seven for 17 to raise his average 50 points in four days. You know, Angel had a, a career year last year. He's not a kid, he's 30 years old. And I was talking to him today, and he said, You know, when, when the season began, I was trying to do what other people thought that I should do on the heels of last season. And he said, The month on the sideline really gave him a chance to think about who he is and what he's supposed to be. And he's got himself another base hit. Jones comes over to cut it off. Pagan trying for two. Jones is toward a second base. Is not in time. And Pagan legs out a double. So Angel Pagan with his second double of the year, hustling all the way. What kind of player did he come to when he was thinking about that? Is he's a line drive hitter. He's got to use his speed. He takes the extra bases. He plays hard. And every time he gets a hit, he always comes out of that box thinking two. Because remember what he was doing early in the season as you look at the Mercedes Benz Ultramo is he was opening up his right shoulder batting left handed and that tells you that he was thinking home run. Or thinking extra base hits mm -hmm. uh, just uh, you know when he hits his line drives he's going to get his extra base hits. So now the red hot Justin Turner will try and get him home and he takes high one to know. Turner has driven in a run in six straight games. He had a streak of seven straight games, a Met rookie record. Then he had two games without an RBI. Now this six-game streak, so he's driven in at least a run in 13 of his last 15 games. McDonald falling off the mound as he throws the pitch, and Turner hits it out to center field. Pagan will tag it second, and he'll move over on the catch by McCutcheon. So the Mets have a runner at third with one out, a productive out for Turner. You know, you say to yourself, oh, boy, that's not a run that in, not a hit for Turner. He's been driving him in since he's come up. That is such a good at bat, uh, hitting the ball up the middle to the other side. Um, team baseball by Justin Turner. So now Carlos Beltran will try and get that runner in from third. So Turner, 13 games in the last 15, he's driven in at least a run. You know the last time a rookie did that? 80 years ago. 80 years 80. ago. Buster Chatham of the Boston Braves in 1930, the last to do it. Inside the Beltron 1 0. So it gives you an idea just the kind of streak that Justin Turner has put together. He had red hair also. You know that? <laughs> Buster? Yeah. <laughs> I think I read that. <laughs> and Beltron lines went right at the first baseman over Bay for the second out, and Pagan has to hold the third. I haven't seen this very often, but both pitchers have started the game the same. R.A. Dickey was able to navigate his way around the leadoff double, and McDonald won eight, one out away from doing it himself. Well, Jason Bay sat out last night, a scheduled day off for him. He's been swinging the bat better lately. Five game hitting streak, six for 19 over that stretch. Still looking to get the production going. He has just nine runs batted in and 116 at bats this season. Jason Bay's first ever at bat against the Pittsburgh Pirates, the team with whom he came into prominence in the major leagues with. And he hits a roller. This might get the run. Donald with the quick toss, not in time. And Pagan comes home to score the game's first run. Well, Jason Bay with a fortunate infield hit. And that drives in his 10th run of the year. Well, when I saw this off the bat, I thought that this was no chance. Swinging bunt, but. James McDonald, what a play he made with that sidearm throw. And just a beat late in getting Jason Bay hustling to first base. Boy, I tell you, if the first baseman could have went out there and kind of got it on that short hop, tough play though, of course, for Overbay, might have had a shot. So Jason Bay's first at bat against his old team results in a run scoring infield hit, one nothing New York. And now Daniel Murphy, who has all of a sudden gotten very hot with the bat, back to back three hit games. And over the last 10 games, he's hitting 421. McDonald extremely slow to the plate. Uh, each and every one of these Mets in the lineup can run. Or if he fouls it off. Well, when you look at the Coors Light Pirates defense, really two names. Harrison, his first career major league game, and Dusty Brown, his first game for the Pirates this season.
curveball sits out of Murphy two and one. James McDonald his first four starts of the year struggled badly. He's been in a good groove lately. We see Murphy's progression. Well, a late swing foul. Murph getting his first ever big league appearance at third base, but that's the position he predominantly played for most of his minor league career. And he played a lot of third base during spring training this year and looked awfully good doing it. Well, he is a reactionary type player. To see Nick Evans getting a start at first base in the on deck circle, uh, reactionary player. So I would think third base would suit him fine. Just got a piece of that. You see his career numbers at third base. It's a lot of errors, but you know what? Everybody makes judge. errors in the box. Yeah, I don't judge that. The bat fields, uh, learning new positions. Um, you see guys routinely have 49 errors in a season. Not routinely, but you've seen it. By the way, for Met historians, it, it used to be a, a number of great prominence because they went through so many of them early in their history. The number of third basemen the Mets have had. I mean, they went through yeah, right. dozens and dozens and dozens over the first couple of decades of the franchise. Well, it's had a lot of stability over the last couple of decades with guys like um, Pojo and, yeah. and Ventura and, and most recently David Wright. But for the record, Daniel Murphy is now the 145th third baseman in Mets history. I, I'll never forget a game we were playing extra innings and we were running out of players. And I asked David to play third because I wanted to be on the list. <laughs> I did because it was a big deal. <laughs> yes, it was. Starting with Don Zimmer. Swing and a miss, and McDonald strikes out Murphy with a curveball. And that retires the side, but the Mets scratch out a run. But Don comes home on Bay's infield hit, and the Mets have a one nothing lead after one. Furniture store of the New York Mets. I know that's a caricature, but does Bob look like that really? I, mean, I, I don't know Bob personally. Okay. Find that out. He's Kevin. Got, he's got the beard very much like uh, like Ari Dickey. <laughs> Lyle Overbay leading off in the second. Overbay won for four last night, hitting a 237 for the year. Pirates have not been an offensive juggernaut this year. They're 13th in the National League in runs scored, 13th in on base percentage, 15th in slugging percentage. But their pitching's been awfully good lately, and that's been enough for Clint Hurdle's team to be within four games of 500 right now. And you see the rankings for the Pirates in the National League. So Clint Hurdles had to be a little creative at times. He's moved his batting order around several times. 
And over Bay tops one up the first baseline for Tolley. And that's the first down. You know, R.A. Dickey has been generating far more ground balls this year than he has in the past. In fact, 68% of his outs have been on grounders this year, which is much more than he's ever had before. Yeah, which which I find remarkable because uh, you know usually that uh, knuckleball is the kind of ball you'll pop up, but uh, as of late, especially, he's had that down in the strike zone. Uh, Clint Hurdle unleashed the um, the knuckleball hitters cliche today. He said, "If it's high, let it fly. If it's low, let it go." <laughs> Garrett Jones ignoring that high knuckleball, and it's one and zero. Clint um, was one of my dear friends. I played an entire season with him in 1983 in Tidewater. And he was a guy that had been destined to be the next great player after George Brett. Kansas City Royals didn't work out for him, but had to go back to the minor leagues, rediscover his game, find a new position, play third base down there, and only drove in 105 runs, hit 285, had 22 bombs, had a great, fantastic year. But one thing I remember about Clint, he came down, he had all the big league clothes, the nice loafers, the whole look with us uh, ragamuffins. <laughs> and Garrett Jones is down swinging. Well, Dickey, after the leadoff doubles, now retired five in a row with a couple of strikeouts. Well, I will say I would never wish an injury on anyone, but with having this foot problem, you can see the knuckleball as it comes out of the hand of Ari Dickey. It's almost like he's not overthrowing the knuckleball, which is a weird thing to say because most it's, it's hard to do that. But I think, as you were saying about Angel Pagan, I think Ari Dickey has tried to take his game up a notch in spring training when he didn't have to take it up a notch. Just stay where he is. The injuries might have helped the both in the long run. Murphy. Fields the one hopper and throws out Ronnie Cedeno. So Dickey has set down six in a row and the Mets lead one up. Home second inning, Nick Evans getting his second start since being called up. Leads off against James McDonald. Nick looking for his first hit of the season. Came up as a pinch hitter last night. Had a nice at bat. Drawing a walk that got the Mets two run rally going in the eighth. Evans getting a chance to play first base today. And Jerry Collins was saying before the game today that the configuration that's out there tonight with Evans at first and Murphy at third, Turner at second. That uh, let's stick with that if Evans hits a little bit. Well, I, I think also, um, you know, that 
has Harrison and Kirsten on the bench, which they were going to start the season there anyway. But I think even more importantly, after the news today, and this is just me personally as Dick Evans walks, um, you know, the news that Ike Davis is going to be in a booth for the next three weeks, I think you have to start assuming as an organization, as a team, as a manager and coaching staff, that they come back when they come back. You just don't know. So let's play hard, boys, as, as we go now, day to day. Well, you have to make plans with the people you know you're going to have. I mean, you, you do the math on Ike now. He's been out three weeks already. He's going to have three weeks more in a boot. You figure it's going to be at least two more weeks after that for conditioning and rehab. So you're probably talking about at the best case scenario the week before the All-Star break. So you have to plan long term as though you don't have them. And when you get them back, that's great. And David's the great unknown, too. So, uh, you know, uh, what you have, you have to concentrate on that. I think that, you know, listen, every organization goes through a series of times where they tend to woe is me and concentrate on the guys that are hurt. And if they weren't hurt, we would be better. Um, the good teams concentrate on who is playing now and how we're going to win now with this outfit. And I think these guys have done it extremely well this season. Josh Tolley is starting to get hot, and McDonald's dusts him one and one. Josh had the big hit last night, a two run double that snapped a 3 3 tie in the seventh. And he has seven RBIs now in his last four games. Well, a double and two RBIs from the night before sometimes gets you a little chin music the next day. Well, right now, McDonald just trying to figure out where the ball is going with his fastballs. Curveball's been okay, but the fastball's been all over the place. Well, you know, watching uh, James warm up before the start of the first and the second inning. Kind of casually goes through getting warmed up, and, and Ray Serge, the pitching coach, I'm sure, would like him to, I don't know, put a little more effort into it and try to replicate what you're going to have to do on the first hitter of the at bat. Out to left field, and Tobin is right there. And that's the first out as Evans goes back to first. Well, just watching McDonald, though, it, it looks as though his mechanics are all over the place. We already saw him kind of fall off the mound at one point on the pitch he threw the Turner earlier in the game. Well, he looks uh, six four, but he looks about six six, doesn't he? Just long and lean, and he has long arms, long legs, and there's a lot of moving parts. So the more moving parts you have as a pitcher, the more you have to work on everything getting to one point, as opposed to maybe to a Santana who's shorter and and doesn't have as many uh, moving point uh, parts. So McDonald sometimes takes a little more time to get everything working together. Now here's Ruben Tejada, three for four last night, and has his average up to 316 through his first 38 big league at bats this year. And a check in on Evans, who's not really a stolen base threat. Sometimes the pitcher dictates offensively what you can do. It's very hard for Terry Collins to put on a hit and run with James struggling with his control here early in the game. James McDonald drafted by the Dodgers out of high school, and he was a pitcher when he was drafted, but he had arm issues, and so the Dodgers made him an outfielder for a couple of years. The farm director at the time for the Dodgers was Terry Collins, and it was Terry who finally made the decision after James's arm got better. To put him back on the mound. And Terry was singing McDonald's praises today, talking about what a great kid he is. He said, as a double play ball is in right at Cedeno, makes the flip to Walker and on to first for the double play. He said, he's a great human being, but I hope he has a terrible night tonight. <laughs> One nothing Mets after two at City Field.
Hitting the road, take the Mets with you this season. Subscribe to MLB.tv today to see every Mets game live or on demand on your computer and your favorite devices. Visit Mets.com to order and get more details. MLB.tv, baseball everywhere. Dusty Brown just called up from Indianapolis. Starts for the Pirates behind the plate tonight. And he hits one right back to Dickey. Now he's going to scramble after it on that bad foot. And he throws out Brown. And Dickey clearly in some discomfort as he planted to make that throw, but handled it successfully for the first out. Well, that's all right. Test number one. A plus. Nice block there by R.A. And, and you know, it takes a lot, Gary, to as you're going after the baseball to go, you know what? I got plantar fasciitis. I got to take my time. Okay, I know the speed of the runner. Make an accurate throw. Boy. No foundation to throw off and still made the play. So now James McDonald who's started his life as minor league outfielder and you can see why he's a pitcher. Three for 49 in his career. And he takes the knuckler for a strike and it's one and one. So McDonald two for 19 this season. Right hand pitcher but a left hand batter. Interesting to watch R.A. pitching today. It's just a complete difference in the way he's approaching the hitter. Locking the pint to Guinness, it looks like he's throwing darts. And he gets McDonald looking. Third strikeout for Dickey. And he's now set down eight in a row. Third inning brought to you by Freescore.com. Three credit scores, one place. Jose Tabata, who led off the game, got a 2 1 fastball and hit it sharply between Evans and the first baseline for a double. He got to third on a ground out, but Dickey allowed no more. And behind Knuckler for a strike, nothing in one. RA's throwing strikes. His ball is moving beautifully. And he may be in some pain, but he's handling it. And that's a beautiful knuckleball 0 2. I mean, that thing is dancing all over the place. And, and it's got a, a enough late movement that Josh can stay with it. I mean, that thing zigzags. It went both ways at once. It went left and then it went right. Josh is just catching one in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> and now he tries the very slow one and it misses high. He didn't see, he didn't get, uh, get a new ball. That wasn't the slow ball. He needed the different ones. That like give me a bucket of curveballs. <laughs> one two to Tabata, and the fastball away. Two and two. Tabata, the former Yankee prospect, just 22 years old, and he pokes another one that almost hugged the line. Interesting though, Nick Evans has moved towards the line after that first at bat, so. Fool me once. Now the 2 2. And the fastball inside and a full count to Tabata. Dickey has really cut down on the walks over his last half dozen starts. He had problems with his control early in the season. But this is now more like last year. Last year he averaged 2.2 walks per nine innings. He's at 3.2 this year, but it was much worse earlier in the year. And, and for you folks at home, 2.2 for a knuckleballer is unheard of. Uh, they're routinely at least four and a half per nine innings. Again, the 3-2, and that's outside ball four. So the first walk of the night issued by Dickey. He comes with two out in the third after he retired eight in a row. And there you see the contrast between the first three starts. When he was all over the place in these last seven, where he has been walking virtually nobody. So Tabata, the only man to reach for the Pirates, now with a double and a walk, and here is Josh Harrison for his second big league at bat. Just the other day, we saw Tony Campana in Chicago, who had just been called up by the Cubs, who, by the way, had four stolen bases yesterday. Campana was from the University of Cincinnati, and he was a college teammate of Josh Harrison. And there's his first big league hit. So Harrison 
Now a 500 hitter in the big leagues and the Pirates will get that ball and take it out of play and save it for the mantelpiece of Josh Harrison. Third base coach Nick Leva taking possession. And it's always the trainer who gets the ball. Over Bay will pass it along. So Josh Harrison has his first big league hit. And the Pirates have their second of the game off Dickey. Now Andrew McCutcheon who struck out his first time up. So when, when Keith and I saw uh, Campana in Chicago yeah. we started thinking about University of Cincinnati they haven't produced a lot of big league players. They we came up basketball with basketball in Cincinnati. Right. I mean we came up with Kevin Euclid and of course we know Sandy Koufax played basketball right. at, with the Bearcats back in the 50s before he signed with the Dodgers. But what I didn't know is that the great Yankee manager Miller Huggins was from the University of Cincinnati. Unless you ask Babe Ruth. You would know. But he's not around. No, as far as he called him a great Yankee manager. Him and Babe uh, went at it yeah. pretty hard. Slick fielding shortstop Eddie Brinkman went to the University of Cincinnati. Detroit Tigers. There go the runners. And a swing and a miss. And McCutcheon is struck out to end the inning. Fourth strikeout for Dickey. And the Pirates strand two. One nothing New York, middle of the third. Home third inning, R.A. Dickey leads off against James McDonald. Dickey has just one hit this season after a very good hitting season last year. Still a lifetime 232 hitter, which any pitcher would take. Well, maybe anybody but Carlos Zambrano. Well, he looks very hitterish up there. I, you know, I, I've seen pitchers before who've had leg issues go up to the plate and not swing. Right. Because they don't want to run the bases. Well, he bloops this one out to right field, and Jones had him played well. And Dickey takes a couple of tentative steps toward first base before peeling off. And clearly, he needs to run as little as possible. Here's your toy to text bowl, having nothing to do with baseball tonight. Wow. NBA Finals start tonight. A for the Heat, B for the Mavericks. Who do you think is going to win it all? Text 57508 or visit SNY.TV to enter. Of course, there are many of us who. For whom this was the first indication that those are the teams in the finals. <laughs> you are just so single minded, Gary. Here's Angel Pagan, who doubled the right center his first time up and scored the only run of the game. So you're not watching the French Open every day? Is that on now? <laughs> Six o'clock in the morning to 12 30. That's still on clay, right? <laughs> That's right. The red clay of Roland Garros. Is Matt is Mats Villander still playing? Mats Villander is done. That big top uh, <laughs> top spin forehand, that's left the game also. 
Pancho Gonzalez. No, Pancho, the he's gone. Stan Smith and the sneakers are both gone. <laughs> one and one to be gone with one out. I actually went to Forest Hills once to watch the U.S. Open. Well, that was great clay courts, too. Yeah. I mean, that was uh, when the U.S. Open was on clay. And you used to park your car in people's driveways. And A little more intimate setting than you have today. Mm -hmm. Two and two now to Pagan. Well, Angel hitting leadoff today. The plan is for Jose Reyes to fly back to New York tomorrow night and be eligible to play on Thursday afternoon for the final game of this series. We'll say we went back to the Dominican for his family in the wake of his grandmother's passing was scheduled to fly out yesterday but his flight was canceled and he actually didn't fly to the Dominican until this morning as Pagan floats one to the left and he's got another hit. Uh, you can really see the difference with Angel Pagan, can't you? It's gap to gap, it's line to line, it's just putting the ball in play, and the results are startling. And not being afraid to be jammed by the baseball. He's got such a strong hitter, and I'm not talking about strong as far as hitting the ball at the ballpark. Strong in the sense that he can fight a pitch off the left field. He was trying to feather that ball out to left field instead of stroking it out there. And much better job now. Well, as he said to me today, if he just does what he's supposed to, he'll hit home runs. But trying to hit home runs, that's not him. So now he's aboard. Let's see if he tries to take off. He's got six steals. And McDonald's checked his in on him. McDonald has a decent uh, move to first base, not a great one, but is around 1.5 to the plate. What does that mean? 1.2, 1.3 is a good uh, indicator to the plate as far as how quick you are. 1.5 is a little slow. And of course, you also have a rookie catcher behind the plate, barely untested, in Dusty Brown. So we'll see if Pagan tries to swipe one. First big league game this season for Brown, who had a handful of games with the Red Sox the last two years. I have to credit the McDonald there, though. Nice slide step and threw a strike. Turner flying deep center field his first time up. And Justin takes the curveball away, one and one. You know, for a guy who has driven in so many runs in a short period of time, Turner's done a great job of laying off the pitches he can't hit. So he's worked himself into hitter's counts, and when he's not in hitter's counts, he puts the ball in play. Amazing things can happen when you don't strike out. I mean, he hasn't walked very much, but he hasn't been afraid to take pitches and get into deeper counts to get the pitch he wants. He really is a ball player, and what I mean by that, I mean, they're all ball players, right? But this guy Justin Turner knows how to play the game knows how it's supposed to be played knows that if you're the second place hitter that's a role that you have to fulfill out to center field and McCutcheon is right there so Turner retired for the second out and Pagan still at first with Beltron coming up well, let's with Turner Jerry you know his last at bat last night he hit a ball that off the wall and deep left center field really uh, caught it well but now two fly balls to center field you know you always worry about that with your younger players you know do they try to you know start hitting the ball in the air and Justin's game is more in the ground and line drives by the way he's got to keep that thumb guard out of his mouth I know you're a germaphobe <laughs> I, I am a germaphobe but as far as on that in that dugout area that's fine a lot of oh, it's just awful down there from the Sunflower seeds to the gum wrappers, etc. Beltron lined out to first base his first trip. And Brown handles that pitch inside. Thought about a snap throw, but held on to it. One and one. Jason Bay, who drove in the only run of this game, waiting on deck. City Field this year, torn it up in this ballpark. He's cooled down a little bit since his raging hot streak. Hasn't hit a home run since his three home run game in Colorado three weeks ago. 
course the Mets haven't had a home run in ages. Pagan runs and Beltran fouls it off. Mets have gone nine straight games without a home run. It's the first time that's happened since 1982. They've also gone nine straight home games without a home run, and that's the first time since 1979. So they're working without their big boppers for the most part. Some hard times uh, in those years yeah. too, 79 to 82. Well, the funny thing is that the Mets right now are thriving, at least the last couple of days, as Pagan runs again. And Walker throws out Beltron to end the inning. 15 hits yesterday, 17 the day before, all without the long ball. They scratched out a run in the first, and so far it's stood up tonight. Neil Walker leading off the fourth inning again batting right handed against the right handed knuckleballer. Walker bounced out to third his first time up. Ari Dickey's thrown up three scoreless innings. He's had to field one ball and appeared to be in some pain as he threw it to first base but no matter he's throwing strikes and has great movement on his knuckleball tonight. Walker pokes one foul. You know it, it, it. And this is before. His injured foot. This is an inner toughness. And I know it comes from. All the difficult years that. R.A. has had to go through through his professional career. But there's an inner toughness that R.A. has that. Not all ball players have. If anyone can pull this off he can. So far so good. There was a question asked before the game of Terry Collins. And it's an interesting question. What is the etiquette if you're the opposing team and you know you've got a pitcher out there with a bad foot about bunting bunting a lot to force him to get off the mound as Walker goes down on strikes. Well the words I can use and there's two of them I can't use on TV. That's would be what you would say <laughs> and that is is that with that young team look at that that's oh, like wow. a, that's what a, a BMW does and when it changes lanes on the Autobahn I mean ooh, straight over there. Um, so you're saying too bad. I get too bad. Yeah. Hang with them. Let's it's check. Let's check in with Kevin Burkhardt. Kevin. Uh, guys a bunch of the Mets players and a couple coaches as well put on a clinic in the parking lot just outside of City Field this afternoon along with the Mets wheelchair softball team. And these guys are good. The Mets players got to see it for themselves. Matter of fact they even got to experience it. Some of them got in the chairs and played and got to see what it was like. This is all part of teammates in the community week for the Mets and it's a military theme this week of course with Memorial Day yesterday basically trying to raise awareness to 
our veterans and our servicemen and women who have been injured in battle just to show them that they are athletic events. You could still be athletically uh, involved if you come back if you are injured. So they're doing that out in the parking lot today, trying to get the word out that there are still uh, plenty of things to be done if you are injured in battle. Nicely done uh, by the softball team and by the Mets. Guys. Part of city teammates in the community and Bill Hannigan, who is. Uh, one of the wheelchair athletes throughout the first pitch today here at City Field. Yeah, it's been amazing. The intrepid, uh, intrepid yesterday for some of the Mets. Uh, Pelfrey was there. Justin Turner was there. Um, and then today with the softball game, just well, well played and one do well done by the Mets organization. And I, I was asking the question because I wasn't sure. You know, I'm not always sure what things that are going around around here. But if they still went around, uh, what, uh, along. With that home plate that was the original Shea home plate and the still dimensions of the old Shea stadium and they have done that. Well the home plate is in the parking lot in the same spot where it was located so is the, uh, the spot where the pitching rubber was so ah, they have cool. continued to have the layout there of the Shea stadium uh, infield that the uh, wheelchair athletes can use in the parking well, lot. Well I'm definitely going to make it out there I want to see how that looks uh, in relation to the. A beautiful city field here. Swing and a miss, and Over Bay is down on strikes, and that is six strikeouts for R.A. Dickey, including the last three. Well, um, I don't think we've seen his knuckleball move uh, his entire career here, and I'm including last season. Uh, Josh Tolley's doing a nice job of somehow catching that in the pocket, but um, fooling the Pittsburgh hitter so far. Somebody needs to check that ball for DUI. <laughs> Two out of nobody on here's Garrett Jones who struck out his first time up. Well I go back to the question about bunting then if it's not taboo to bunt why in the heck aren't they because they certainly aren't hitting the ball. I, I'll take it a step further. Who's playing his first game at third base. Right. Popped up Tejada retreating and calling as he goes and the side retired. All right, Dickey in a groove despite the bad foot. He's got a one nothing lead. Jason Bay leads off the bottom of the fourth and fouls the first pitch fastball back from James McDonald. Bay topped a ground ball along the third baseline for an infield hit to drive in the only run of this game in the opening inning. Jason stuck on two home runs this year. His fellow Canadian concussion victim, Justin Morneau, just hit his third home run for Minnesota. So Morneau is up one. <laughs> And Jason lifts one out to right field and Garrett Jones circles under it. 
one away. It's all things New York sports all on one side SNY.TV the ultimate blog network featuring a continuous flow of sports news straight from the best New York sports blogs SNY.TV your online home of all things New York sports. Now Daniel Murphy who struck out his first time up. That's the only strikeout for McDonald so far tonight he's averaged over seven and a half strikeouts. Per nine innings. But the Mets of late have been a, doing a fine job of putting the ball in play. And well, the previous two games before tonight, that led to 32 hits in a two game span. Those 13 two out hits on Sunday was something I've never seen. You know, I mean, obviously, never seen a Met team do because it was a franchise record. But uh, that was just amazing. Well, consider this: the Mets have had back-to-back -back games of 15 or more hits without hitting a home run. It's only the second time in club history that's happened. It happened in 1998. They had back-to-back 15-hit -back games without a home run. And the curveball rifled in the left center, a base hit for Murphy. But catching gets over quickly to cut it off. Murph's going to try for two. The throw by McCutcheon on a hop. Walker with the tag, and Murph can't get away, and he is out. Now you saw Pagan stretch earlier in the game, but that was against Garrett Jones. This against Andrew McCutcheon has got a much better arm. Well, I'm not going to say it because McCutcheon uses his speed, but it's almost like he enticed Murphy to go. He said, you know what, I'm going to take my time out here, and then I'll, oh, I forgot, Murph, I have this arm that'll throw you out. He just uh, is an outstanding center fielder, great at getting to that baseball, threw a strike, a nice play by Wal Walker, the two to whatever that dance was with Murphy. <laughs> It's the follow me. <laughs> He's trying to give him the arm, take it away, dive back in, but Walker did a nice job. Cha cha cha. <laughs> so two out of nobody on, and Nick Evans swings and misses at the curveball. And that's been easily the best pitch for McDonald tonight, that hook. And he's ahead 0 2. Evans drew a walk on four pitches his first time up. That's now with four hits off McDonald, who has walked just the one. Daniel Murphy will make his mistakes, but almost uniformly, they are mistakes of aggression. I said it to you before the game. I would love to have played with Murph, um, only because he just reminds me in some ways. Now, at this stage in his career, he's still learning how to play the game. But playing with Lenny Dykstra was a trip every single game. There would be things that he would do. He had his own brand of baseball, really, Lenny. And. Uh, and he became one of my favorites just watching him play night in and night out and he did exactly what Lenny used to do get on that bench and tell you exactly what what he was thinking why he did it. <laughs> but it's great he uh, he's a hustler and you know what I know a lot of his teammates in the past have said he's kind of like Joe College you know maybe the Mets could use a little more Joe College sometimes. And Evans as he did last night works an 0 2 count to 3 and 2. The thing that Murphy doesn't have that Lenny had, Lenny had his own language too. <laughs> and the curveball in for a call, third strike. Nice hook by McDonald to get Evans and end the inning. His second strikeout. We played four at City Field with the Mets up one nothing.
David Wright Foundation's fifth annual Las Vegas night, Thursday, June 2nd at the South Street Seaport in Manhattan. Individual tickets can be purchased by visiting DavidWrightFoundation.com. And by BMW, the ultimate driving machine. If they Ari Dickey's allowed just two hits over the first four. He'll face the lower third of the Pirates order in the fifth. Ronnie Cedeno bounced out to third his first time up and tried to bunt his way on. So the first Pirate to try and lay one down against the sore footed Dickey and Cedeno fails to get it down. Of course it's not that easy to bunt a knuckleball. Well exactly the one thing that you have though is you're probably not going to center it so it'll probably be deadened off the back. But you're right. Terry Collins was saying something very interesting about the injury that Dickey is dealing with the partially torn plantar fascia in his foot as you look at Dusty Brown on deck Terry didn't mention the guy by name but he said he once had a player with a similar injury and it's in there for a call third strike that's seven strikeouts now for Dickey matching his season high to hurt his foot every week <laughs> one out. Well, so Daniel thinks this is going to go out and it stays true to form does not move. That ball didn't rotate at all at all. Stay true almost the entire way. Mercedes Benz Ultramo brought to you by your tri-state dealers on the web at search Mercedes dot com. But what Terry was saying is that the player that he had before who had this same injury tried his darndest to turn that partial tear into a complete tear. Mm. And that once he did once it was completely torn. It was no problem anymore. You get relief. Pain's gone. Have you had it? I, I've had it, but just uh, you know, certainly not at this level. And I was already retired. But it just feels like a rubber band on the bottom of your foot that just feels like it's going to snap at any time. It's a very, very strange feeling, to tell you the truth. It's very tender, very sore. Dickey's major league strikeout high is eight. So one and two on Brown. Let's check in with Kevin to see uh, what else is going on in the injury front. Guys, General Manager Sandy Alderson's updates are getting longer and longer by the day. By the way, he talked about Ike Davis, and you know he really said, "Look, the three weeks is, is pretty solid. I mean, unless Ike is just feeling a heck of a lot better before then, he's not going to be reevaluated before that period. So um, he's going to be out a while." He said, "You know, he can hit in, in this time, but he really can't put any pressure on the leg. So he's out of commission for a long time." David Wright. He's going to get x-rays on Thursday just to see if there's progression being made. It's now been five weeks since the Carlos Lee play against the Astros when the Mets think that he heard it although there's some speculation that he heard it before that as to how will have a chance and there's two away. But if the x-rays come up uh, showing good pictures then David will go on to the next stage of his, of his rehab kind of advanced core exercises and then baseball activities to follow. Good news on Johan Santana's part. He's on the mound throwing intervals. Basically, 15 pitches on the mound, takes a break, gets back on, just 15 more pitches. Uh, Mets hope that he's throwing batting practice in the coming days. So he's moving forward quite nicely. Guys? Yeah, Kevin, I want to go back to the David Wright injury because this is the first that we've heard about the possibility that David might have had a pre existing injury in that back. Do we have any more information about that kind of speculation about? When he might have done it, or whether David has any inkling himself. Sandy said it was discussed not by David, but uh, you know by the Mets front office and the doctors, and they really don't know Gary, but they do feel there's a possibility that the injury was there, and that play really exacerbated it. So, you know, what Sandy said is even if that's the case, it really doesn't change the rehab right now. The bottom line is, you know, whether that play is the play that kind of the straw that broke the camel's back, or whether it happened on the play, he doesn't think it would have changed uh, the. The course of events right now for David. All right, Dickey matches his career high with his eighth strikeout as he fans James McDonald for the second time. Why right tonight for Dickey so far? Halfway through, it's one nothing.
game three matchup as Jonas Schwartz and Joe Beningo bring you up to speed with the latest news, opinion, and exclusive interviews on Daily News Live presented by City, part of the New York Sports Local tomorrow at 5 on SNY. Josh Tolley leads off the home fifth inning and takes a strike from James McDonald. Let's hope that the Mets can hold this lead. Joe's much kinder, uh, much better mood when the Mets are on a winning streak. But the uh, the irony of it is, of course, he's much more entertaining when they're on a losing That's streak. Right. <laughs> oh, he is one of my favorites. You know, uh, Joe one and Evan made their way to Chicago for the series. Oh, we we'll hope they had their parkers on. Well, they were smart enough to do their show the last day from indoors. Well, one of the flags to another. Yeah, yeah, I got it. I got it. Ruben Tejada on deck, and then R.A. Dickey here in the home fifth. And McDonald misses away with the fastball, three and one. You don't get better than Joe Beningo. He just loves his Mets. I think he even loves the Jets more. I think so. He certainly, well, he has more time between games to emote. And there's strike three and two. Too high ball four and Tolly is aboard with a walk. Second walk given up by McDonald's and the Mets have the leadoff man on for the third time in five innings. Here's Ruben Tejada who bounced into a double play his first time up. That's got their run in the first inning a leadoff double by Pagan an advancing fly ball by Justin Turner and an infield hit by Jason Bay. James McDonald has held the fort. He's had base runners in every inning since. And he throws a first pitch strike to Tejada. The Pirates pitching staff is on a remarkable stretch right now. Their starting pitchers have gone 11 straight games allowing two earned runs or less. Charlie Morton was charged with only one earned run last night. Should have been two official scorers mistake. Bounce to third and a foul ball. I get worked up about these things because I, I'm a stickler. I know. I, I listen. If, you, if you're not going to get it right, don't do it. Well, the Mets scored those two runs in the second inning, and they were both ruled to be unearned by the official score last night. One of them should have been earned because the way that you figure those things out is by reconstructing the inning. And if you take away the pass balls, the Mets would have had second and third and two out, and that's when Tejada got his infield hit, and Murphy would have scored. But in his wisdom, the official scorer somehow thought he wouldn't have scored. Hey, listen, I'm a couple of official scores away from being the Mets Hall of Fame. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, but they never gave you unearned runs when they should have given you earned runs. <laughs> See the thing about it is if you if you rule a run unearned nobody's unhappy except people like me. That's right. Because the pitcher's happy and the offensive team couldn't care less. As long as you don't short somebody in RBI. <laughs> then you get an argument. Tejada would have had a problem with that then. So he's still got his RBI. <laughs> two and two to Ruben. With Tolly at first and nobody out and he bounces one foul. And Chappelle with a nice grab always use two hands. And then make a friend. Well, you know, when you're the infield coach, you know how much pressure it is on you at third base to come up with the ball? I mean, they're all over you if you drop that. See, the key for a base coach is knowing what to go after and what to ignore. If it's hit too hard or it might take a funny bounce, you just pretend it's not there and you leave it alone. But if you go after it, you, you can't you can't make an error. Well, I, I, the, one of the funniest ones ever, of course, happened in the All-Star game. And the reason I mention it was a broken hat, bat by Vladimir Guerrero that almost knocked down, or did knock down, um, Tommy the Sword. And, of course, we send our best wishes to Tommy. He's had a bacterial infection. He's been in the hospital. and uh, But he's back home now. Yeah, and we're, we're wishing him the best. Breaking ball, strike three called. So another two-strike curveball by McDonald. He got Evans looking in the fourth, and now he gets to Hata. And if you're home, you're saying to yourself, well, why aren't these Mets hitters looking for that curveball? Very rarely do you see that straight overhand 12 to 6 curveball that starts right at the hitter and bends over that inside part of the plate. Nice pitching 
uh, by McDonald. So the Delta keep climbing overhead cam and a big hand for R.A. Dickey as he comes to bat. I think the fans can really appreciate what R.A. is going through tonight. And he has responded to the injured foot with one of his best outings ever. He's allowed just two hits and he's already matched his career high with eight strikeouts through five innings. Watch when the pitch is coming. It's almost like he's readjusting both feet so he can get a nice place and a nice comfortable spot. Comes inside and clips the bat of Dickey. And that's a foul ball, one and two. Maybe the first time he was affected because he couldn't get out of the way. That's a pitch that RA in the past would have taken for a ball. See the grip with the hand? Have that behind the bat. The bat protects your thumb and your fingers. Bunt still on with two strikes, and then he takes a swing. And it's a foul ball. So the at bat continues. It's interesting that he would use the butcher boy play in that circumstance, particularly when it might force him to have to run. Well, I think he's butcher boy is the butcher boy in a place where it becomes a sacrifice because they're really being aggressive, especially with uh, Harrison and Josh Harrison at third base. And now he bunts it foul for strike three. So Dickey unable to get the bunt down. And that's the fourth strikeout for McDonald. So now two out of the inning, and Angel Pagan, who has two of the Mets' four hits, he doubled and scored in the first, singled in the third. Nine for 19 since coming off the disabled list. Good when you were hitting 159 going on to the DL. He's up to 227 now. But a quick climb. One and two to Pagan. Hey, the Nationals go up a five spot against Cliff Lee in the third inning tonight. The Lee's came back with two in the fifth on home runs by Dominic Brown and John Mayberry. Five to two, Nats in the fifth. Considering how Philadelphia is playing, they'll probably score three more late. Lee will pitch eight, and they'll win six to five. Lee's been a little up and down this year. Donald ahead one and two. And he bounces one and Brown knocks it down. Two and two. Just off the plate and a full count's begun. So now Tolley will be on his way.
And Pagan launches one to deep right field. Back goes Jones to the track. Near the fence, he makes the grab. Right back in the Mo zone with that overhang sometimes intervenes, but not this time. Most interesting players in the major leagues, and what sometimes gets lost in all of the erudition is the fact that this man is as tough as they come, and he has shown that here tonight. Jose Tabin, a diving stop by Murphy, and he fires and gets him. What a play by Murphy! His first big league game at third base, and he makes a sparkling play. But made this more difficult. He had to be in with the threat of the bunt and a tough hop coming up, Murph. And Murph strong arm to first base. It's an arm you don't get to see too much when he plays first or second base. But Daniel Murphy's always had a very strong arm. Nice play. Well, I know that when we've watched Murph play third base in the past, I've always felt as though this is his best position. Mm, I agree. Of course, we've only seen him during spring training, but now getting to play in a real big league game. Here's Josh Harrison, his first major league game. At any position, and he's playing third. He's bounced to short and picked up his first big league, big league hit, snuck a single into left. He was the last man to reach against R.A. Dickey, who twice tonight has retired eight batters in a row. There have been only three base runners for the Pirates Tabata, a double and a walk, and Harrison, that single in the third. And a bouncer for Tejada to come in on. And there are two out. That's nine in a row for Dickey. Let's check in with Chris Carlin. He has a New York State Smokers quit line game break. Danny Espinosa leads National League rookies in home runs and RBIs, while Justin Turner leads in batting average. Espinosa hitting two and change. <laughs> McCutcheon uh, with as bad a swing as you can have against the knuckleball, but that's the way that ball's been dancing tonight for Dickey. McCutcheon has contributed two of the eight strikeouts for RA. And he chases another one that he doesn't come close to, and it's 0 and 2. This is like watching. Uh, Animation. 
knuckleball anime. You know what the amazing part tonight has been? Josh Tolley's caught every one. I mean that ball has moved as much as any knuckleball that we've ever seen from R.A. and Tolley's been up to the task. You know, I think that when he wasn't getting hits, Josh was pressing not only offensively but defensively. And the last couple of days has been outstanding. It's allowed him to catch his breath, get a little confidence, and relax back there. Catch your breath, catch the knuckleball. Just off the plate. Two and two. And the Cutchin down swinging to end the inning. A new career high, nine strikeouts for R.A. Dickey. For a shutout of the Cubs' his last start. And Jonathan Neese will open the series against the Braves on Friday night. Justin Turner, first pitch swinging, pops one up in a shallow center. And the shortstop, Sedanu, takes charge. One pitch and one out in the home sixth. Well, there is very sad medical news today regarding Gary Carter. The uh, doctors at Duke have confirmed. That the biopsies on Gary's brain show a glioblastoma, which is an inoperable brain cancer. And uh, the doctors are saying that they have uh, recommended an aggressive treatment of chemotherapy and radiation. Gary's going to go home to Florida and uh, start this next phase of his treatment. And all we can say is that, uh, kid, we're with you all the way. We uh, we wish you nothing but the best, and we know how how. Tough you are and how strong you are, and uh, you beat this. That's a um, <clears throat> really hard uh, thing for me to talk about. Just uh, Gary Carter, the two finest human beings I've ever played with in baseball, both played with the Mets. Mookie Wilson was at first base, and Gary Carter. And uh, you know, it's just it, it's almost I can't believe it. I mean, that's how awful it is. And uh, you know, all I can think of, you, you said it best. You know, he's got great faith. He's got an amazing family, and that's going to serve him well through this difficult time. But I think even more importantly, um, Gary's always been the guy who never wanted to make the last out. So maybe that'll serve him well. Well, uh, all our best to the Carter family. I know how strong they have been through this um, ordeal, which uh, you know is going to become that much tougher. But uh, 
there's been such an incredible outpouring of support from from Met fans and and from from people everywhere because Gary Carter is a beloved figure not just in this country but in Canada as well. I mean, think about the impact he had on that community in Montreal for the 11 years that he played there as Beltron picks up a one out here for the Mets. That's with Gary Carter. That's only a small part of the story. Yep. The numbers. I will tell you too. I have to thank the Mets every night that we've sat here during this homestand. They have a wonderful tribute to all the great times that Gary had in a Met uniform on the field. All the great things they did every single time I watch one of his great hits, or home runs, or throwing out a. Vince Coleman on the bases uh, brings a smile to my face. So uh, well played by the Mets. Thank you. Jason Bay is driven in the only run of this game with a first inning infield hit. And he bounces this one to the left side. Cedeno gets the out at second. Walker the relay not in time. And the inning continues. 6 4 on the force play for the second out. So now Daniel Murphy who has one of the Mets five hits tonight single to left center in the fourth tried to stretch it into a double and Andrew McCutcheon threw him out. James McDonald has pitched a fine game in his own right tonight, keeping his team in it after giving up a first inning run. But R.A. Dickey has been right on top of it tonight. I mean, with all the great games we've seen R.A. pitch since he came up with the Mets last May, this is as good as he's ever been. I think it's better than the one hitter he threw last season. Donald paying attention to Bay, who will sneak a steal every now and again. Has three this year. Chris Resop up in the Pirates bullpen. McDonald up to 94 pitches. He's only cleared 100 in two of his last 12 starts, so this is usually where he starts to fade out. One and one to Murphy. McDonald threw 99 pitches in six innings in his last start against the Braves. Gave up two runs in six innings in that game. Ray Searage, the Pirate pitching coach, keeping an eye. Two and one to Murph. Yeah. Murphy slaps one foul, two and two. McDonald, whose cousin Darnell plays outfield for the Boston Red Sox. A very athletic family. Toward the hole, and Murphy's got his second hit of the night. May turns second, holds on there, and the Mets have two on and two out. So Murphy with eight hits in his last three games. He has just found it. Talked out about that athletic family. And when I was looking at the bio, I, I looked at it before for James. He's been around so long now. Uh, his dad was a tight end for the LA Rams. And uh, as Ray Serge comes out to speak to him, and it's a mini jam for James, um, I just find it so interesting because I'm sure there's a boatload of our fans. That didn't even know there were any Rams in LA. You mean a, a professional football team a in professional Los Angeles? Team. By the way, they were my favorite team because they had Jack Snow, the receiver, and even more importantly, they had the beautiful helmet, right? And Roman Gabriel, who's their quarterback. Not only did he have a great name, but for you people that know what I look like, he was the first guy that I'd ever seen that could 
hey, that guy kind of looks like me, and I don't even know what his his uh, his makeup is. But um, I said, boy, that guy kind of looks like me. That's cool. See, I, I like the Rams, too, and I, I like them because of the fierce enforcer. There you go. Well, of course, Merlin Olsen. Merlin Olsen, Lamar Lundy, uh, Roosevelt Greer. And who am I missing? You're missing Rosie Greer. I always thought Rosie Greer was great because he was so active politically also. Here's Nick Evans who's walked and struck out 0 for 1 looking for his first hit of the season. And he takes the curveball inside for ball one. Of course there's a whole generation of folks who remember Merlin Olsen as an actor not as a football player. The Waltons right? No uh, Little House on the Prairie. Oh, little House on the Prairie that's right. 100 pitches for McDonald's there goes. Day and he steals third standing up. He's got an enormous jump going on his own. Murphy did not follow him. Well, you can see no one holding him on, so if no one's going to hold John, well, I guess just take the base. It'd be nicer if Murphy could have followed also. It's hard for me to believe this, but we actually forgot Deacon Jones. Oh. <laughs> I've worked with Deacon many times. It's like forgetting Sandy Koufax. <laughs> Here's the 1 1, and that curveball stays high. So McDonald, who earlier was able to throw that curve for a strike anytime he wanted to, has missed with a couple in this at bat. And another one misses, and now it's 3 and 1. Now you got Josh Tolley waiting on deck. Pirate bullpen is active. And you have to think that if Evans gets on, that that would be all for McDonald. As Chris Resop continues to loosen. And Evans takes a hack and fouls off the fastball. It's as hard as McDonald's thrown all night. You know, you never want to manage with your heart. You want to manage with your head what's best for your ball club. Sometimes it's tough to take a starting pitcher out when you haven't scored him any points. You know, Clint Hurdle's been around the block. Of course, managing in Colorado, you always have to be hesitant about taking your pitcher out. 3 2, and Evans goes down swinging at the fastball. So McDonald comes back to strike out Evans with a couple of nasty heaters and keep it a 1 0 game. Juano makes the start against Kevin Correa as the Mets continue their four game set against the Pirates here at City Field. Mets Pirates coverage begins with Pepsi Max pregame live tomorrow at 6.30 only on SNY. All right Dickey back to the mound. He's retired 10 in a row. 
And over that stretch has struck out six of the ten. On route to a career high nine strikeouts tonight. Neil Walker leading off and again batting right handed against Dickey. As it worked for him so far he's grounded out and struck out 0 for 2. I guess I've never really seen anybody switch in the middle of a game. Yeah. Where they've tried this. Right handed versus right handed approach as a switch hitter. Well I honestly believe um, and no one's done it tonight. Uh, the. Movement of Dickey's knuckleball is usually tends to be middle of the plate to down and in. Mm -hmm. All right to the left handed hitter might serve you well or better at least to hit from that left side. Maybe hook one down the line. Yeah. Well, he's kept the pitch count down. Gave up a leadoff double in the first inning. That was the biggest threat for the Pirates. He was able to work around that with a big strikeout of Andrew McCutcheon. And been hardly threatened since. One and two to Walker with Lyle Overbay and Garrett Jones to follow here in the seventh. Against Dickey, it has hardly mattered this year, ironically enough. The left hand hitters coming into the day were hitting 303 against him, and the right hand hitters 302. Out to left field, and Jason Bay is there, and this will be the first outfield put out of the night behind R.A. Dickey. It's been all strikeouts, ground balls, and one infield pop up before that. Well, That's those, how good he's been. And those numbers uh, over 300 from both sides, a lot of that damage done early, of course. Mm -hmm. So one out here's Lyle Overbay who has hit a dribbler on which totally threw him out in the second then he struck out in the fourth. It has been a night of first pitch strikes for R.A. He's just been extraordinary. 17 of 22 hitters he's thrown a first pitch strike. And I don't think there's been one first pitch fastball. It's been all knuckleball. Little dribbler and in comes Turner to play it. And quickly there are two out. That's 12 in a row retired by Dickey. The last man to reach for the Pirates was Josh Harrison who picked up his first big league hit a two out single in the third. And since then, R.A. has been spotless. So they're trying to give him some time now. Watch the first ball that he's had to go to first base. You can see right there breaking it down, and a little, a uh, couple of epithets into the glove, and we see that he is compromised um, with that kind of movement. Well, it's the second time he's had to move on a fielding play. The first time he came in front of the mound to throw out Dusty Brown in the third, and had a very delicate plant of the right foot as he threw to first base. And that appeared to give him some discomfort, but this making that quick first step toward first base appeared to trouble him even more. Garrett Jones is 0 for 2, and he swings through the knuckleball, and it's 0 and 2. Now the 0 2 and Jones pops one up in from third base comes Murphy to call and the side retired. R.A. Dickey's retired 13 Pirates in a row. It's the seventh inning stretch at City Field with the Mets up one nothing.
Danny Espinosa with that three run homer off Cliff Lee as the Nats in front of the Phillies six to two now Espinosa with two home runs now it is ninth and his tenth and is six to two in the sixth Freddie Freeman with a two run double and the Braves and Padres are tied two two that game's in the sixth Mike Miner pitching for the Braves tonight and Corey Hart with a three run homer that has the Brewers in front of the Reds. That's four to two in the as they go to the sixth. Well, Evan Meek was their all-star representative last season for the Pittsburgh Pirates. He was on the disabled list in late April and through May with right shoulder tendonitis, but is unscored upon in his last ten outings. He has only made two appearances since coming back from the uh, disabled list. So McDonald, who gave up a scratch run in the first inning, pitched wonderfully. But stands to be the losing pitcher at the moment. Josh Tolley takes up and away from Meek for ball one. Tolley is flying to left and drawn a walk. Ruben Tejada on deck and then R.A. Dickey. And Dickey went through, through some pain during that last inning. And as he came into the dugout, he and Dan Worthen had a conversation. And it is telling that there's nobody up in the Mets bullpen. So that'll tell you that Dickey said whatever it is that he felt. He can work around. Crickets. There's a strike two and one to Tolley. Meek's velocity has been down a little bit since he's come back. He used to be more of a 94 guy. Now he's been more 90 to 92. the 2 2 and totally fouls it away. Meek had an extraordinary year last year for Pittsburgh. 80 innings only 53 hits allowed. Better than 2 to 1 strikeout to walk ratio. He deserved to be an all star. Of course, every team's got to have one. Tolley hits one past the mound, and sedeno has got it. And that retires Tolley one away. Let's check in with Kevin Burkhart. Kevin? Well, guys, talking to Dave Hudgens about Ruben DeHaan, who's obviously shown you something since he's been up here at the play. And he said, you know, he's situation situationally, he's very, very good. But I would like him to not hit the ball in the air as much as he does. In fact, the name that he brought up, Gary, I think the name that you brought up last year, Placido Polanco of the Phillies. He's like, I'd like him to be like that. And kind of emulate him a little bit more line drives more ground balls so the other thing for Ruben is he has kind of a three pitch clock in his head a lot of the times where you know the first three pitches he's swinging irregardless of the pitch he said that's fine if it's a good first pitch swing put a good swing it by swing on it by all means but if not I'd like him to be a little bit more patient I'm not even saying drawing walks but just be a little bit more selective and if that means going deeper in the counts so be it guys. Well you go deeper into counts when you get more confidence as a major league hitter and that's what happens to all young players is that they come up can't wait to swing the bat want to produce some hits and these big league pitchers know that and uh, adjust accordingly and throw a lot of pitches out of the strike zone. One and one to Tejada. Kevin, it's nice to go to you for one of these reports and not see you in a heavy coat. I tell you what, I don't care if it's 140 out there. It's uh, very nice to be back in the warm weather, that's for sure. That report you did under the umbrella will become an SNY classic for me, Kevin. Yeah, I got uh, I got ribbed on pretty good about that one, <laughs> by the way. Just uh, FYI. <laughs> I don't think my umbrella report was as bad as the Cubs bullpen coach's jacket, though. No, that <laughs> I gotta was, be fair. That was that was outstanding. That was the nook of the North material. <laughs> Les Strode had it covered that day. One two to Tejada, and he lays off the breaking ball. Well, on our first 95 degree day, we'll check back in with you see if you have the same uh, 
Same approach. <laughs> Probably won't, but <laughs> right now I do. <laughs> so do we all. Now the 2 2 for Meek. And Tejada serves a foul. Ruben had the longest at bat for a Met this season on this homestand. A 16 pitch extravaganza that resulted in a walk against Antonio Bastardo of the Phillies last Friday night. So, you know, if you're looking for longer term, longer turns at bat from Ruben, he covered about a week's worth in that one. And he bounces one down to third. Josh Harrison's got it. Good arm, two out. So two out and nobody on, and now Ari Dickey will take the turn. Well, Ari had uh, some folk hero status off his performance last year, and uh, off his performance tonight. That legend only becomes more glistening. One and one to RA. He's allowed only two hits. He struck out a career high nine, all while playing with a very painful condition in his right foot. It's shades of the bloody sun. And a chopper going to stop about halfway to first base. And that'll do it for the inning. And uh, R.A. clearly suffering with the pain in his foot, but he'll go back to the mound for the eighth with a 1 nothing lead. There's much LeBron hate out now there. Now there's heat haters. That's what it is. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Almost two thirds in Dallas. Ronnie Cedeno leads off the eighth inning against Ari Dickey. Corners in, but Cedeno swings and rips a base hit to left, and the Pirates have just their third hit of the night. So the tying run aboard with nobody out. Let's check in with Chris Carlin for a New York State Smokers quit line game break.
Let's see where that ball went. He has unusual power. Wow. He really does. Is Dusty Brown popping up the butt attempt, and in comes Evans to snag it as Dickey went down doing a face plant, but he appears to be okay. It's quite an adventure out there for RA. There were three people coming together there. First baseman Evans who made the nice catch. R.A. just avoiding and Josh Tolley with the point. Nick's got to yell a little louder and keep R.A. from having to make that effort. There's Jason Isringhausen up in the bullpen. Meanwhile, Matt Diaz pinch hitting for the Pirates. The former Brave has gotten very little playing time. I mean, think about Matt Diaz not being able to crack this lineup. Yeah. He's hitting just 244. Mets are starting Chris Capuano tomorrow, so you have to think he's got a shot to play against the lefty. And Diaz takes a rip at the knuckleball, nothing in one. Jose Veras, the former Marlin and Yankee, up in the Pirates' bullpen. Mets have seen quite enough of Matt Diaz over the last few years. Big at bat here with the tying run at first base in the eighth inning. We'll say top of the leadoff hitter on deck. And Diaz takes a strike and Dickey's ahead again 0 and 2. Seems like he's been 0 and 2 all night. Diaz thought this ball was inside but it curls left late. A nice job by Josh. But Doug Eddings the home plate umpire has always had a a pitcher's edge to him. And a swing and a miss. He struck him out. Double digit strikeouts for Dickey for the first time in his career. Again, that knuckleball that starts in the middle darts off the plate away. Ty is even trying to go that way. Can't catch up to it. First man to get 10 strikeouts in a game this year. The last to do it. I don't remember this. Maybe you do. Pat Mish. Last October 1st against the Nats had 10 strikeouts. The same Pat Mish who today was out right at the Buffalo. Here's Jose Tabata. Tabata has been aboard twice and only a fine play by Daniel Murphy kept it from being three times. Murphy made a diving stop going to his left and threw out Tabata in the sixth. There goes the runner. The pitch it, it hit him. It hits Tabata, and the Pirates have two men on. Or was it a foul ball? It did hit him. The home plate umpire Doug Edding saying it hit his elbow. Well, this one instead of going left comes and follows Tabata and does catch him right on the end of the elbow. And so the Pirates get a runner into scoring position for the first time since the third inning. Well, Matt Diaz back in the dugout after striking out. Yeah, he'll have to use another bat the next time. That was uh, well done. Dan Worth and out to talk to R.A. Dickey before he faces Josh Harrison with two men on. Is your Home Depot doing more on defense? It's the R.A. Dickey model catcher's glove. Boy, that's interesting, right? Whenever you're a knuckleball pitcher, you have to bring your own catcher's glove. Here in the major leagues, you probably have a better shot of getting two or three of them. But when you travel around the minor leagues, that's part of your gear. By the way, Dickie's got a two-year contract. Josh should get his own. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be here for a while. So now Harrison, in his first big league game, has a big at bat in the eighth inning in a one-nothing game. The tying and lead runs aboard. Harrison is one for three. And he lines it past the glove of Evans in the right field, a base hit. Cedeno heads home. The throw goes toward third, moving up as Harrison to second. He is safe there, and the Pirates have tied the game at one. Josh Harrison in his first big league game has his second hit and his first major league RBI to get the Pirates even. Well, we've seen him pull the ball all night long, but this time nice hitting by Harrison, hitting it in that hole right past the leap of Nick Evans Beltron chooses to go to third base nice play by Murph to come up and try to catch the runner at second base I thought might he might have got it him on like the hip he was out didn't he I thought he got him on the hip to Hada before he touched the base but the call by the umpire on second base Dana DeMuth 
lead umpire. No, good call. He got the hand. Very in. good call by Dana. Now Andrew McCutcheon, and they are pitching to him. First base is open. Neil Walker on deck, so the Mets choosing to go after McCutcheon rather than Walker because Dickey has struck out McCutcheon three times in a row tonight. And McCutcheon swinging at the knuckleball, one and one. And in R.A. Dickey's own words, the capriciousness of a knuckleball probably doesn't allow you to walk the bases loaded, or get the bases loaded, and have to throw the knuckleball to Walker. So the lead run at third with two down and a 1 1 game in the eighth. And a backhand stop by Tolley, 2 and 1. RA up over 100 pitches now. Mets have Isringhausen ready in the bullpen. A leadoff single by Cedeno, but then a hit batsman and a two out hit for Josh Harrison get the Pirates even. And that's a way, and now it's 3 and 1. Dickey has walked only one tonight and struck out a career high 10. Neil Walker on deck. So James McDonald is now off the hook. On three and one, McCutcheon watches on the outside corner, three and two. Very interesting. Uh, watching hitters with guys on second and third, two outs. A strike call called by home plate umpire Doug Eddings, and it looked like McCutcheon was looking for the walk. Three two. Outside ball four, the bases are loaded. And we'll see if Dickey gets one more batter or whether Terry Collins goes to Jason Isringhausen. Well, he's not moving. He deserves one more. Only the second walk for Dickey tonight. So with the bases loaded, two down, tie game in the eighth inning. Dickey will stay in to face Walker, who's gone 0 for 3 tonight. Round out, strike out, fly out. It's been a heroic night for R.A. Dickey, but it's on the line right now. Better swings by Walker with that fly out to left in his last at bat. And he takes the first pitch knuckler for a strike. Tobin at third, Harrison at second, and McCutcheon at first with two down. Dickey 106 pitches deep. He's thrown as many as 109 in a game this year. And a foul ball. Nothing in two. He's gone to the harder knuckleball during this at bat. Most difficult this pitch will be is not only the walker, it could be Josh Tolley. This will be the one that has the great, great movement. Line drive base hit and the Pirates take the lead. Tobin is in. Harrison right behind him. Pagan's throw is cut off. A two run single for Neil Walker has given the Pirates a three to one lead in the top of the eighth. And after all that wonderful work by R.A. Dickey tonight, he will exit on the short end. Well, I was right and I was wrong. Right when I said the Walker was getting much better swings. Completely wrong with that 0 2 pitch. But I thought that Dickey would get the most movement of the night. He got the least. The Pirates with a three run, two out rally in the eighth inning send Dickey out on the short end. <laughs> Call to the bullpen brought to you by Lincoln. Jason Isringhausen coming on in relief.
Jason Isringhausen on to pitch for the fifth time in the last six days. Boy, getting a lot of work as Isringhausen. He has struggled as of late. Last night, able to work through an inning, but had struggled with his control. Lyle Overbay up with two out and two on, and he fouls off the first pitch fastball. Very different look for the Pirates now with Dickey out of the game. Now, well, Dickey had two out and a runner at first here in the eighth. Ronnie Cedeno took off on the first pitch to Jose Tabata. Looked like Tolley had a pretty good chance of throwing Cedeno out, but the ball just ticked the elbow of Tabata. And then a base hit by Harrison tied the game. McCutcheon walked in. Walker's single up the middle on an 0 2 pitch. Put the Pirates in the lead. You have to say a really unfortunate way for a brilliant, somewhat courageous effort by R.A. Dickey to come to a close. Talk about the air coming out of the balloon. Mm -hmm. Wow. Ten strikeouts over seven and two thirds, a new career high for Dickey. But now he's on the short end of a three to one score. 0 2 to Overbay. And the breaking ball stopped by Tolley, one and two. Isringhausen pitched last night, worked a one, two, three, eighth inning. Garrett Jones would be the ninth man up in the inning if he comes to bat. Jose Veras has been throwing a long time now in the Pirate bullpen, waiting to come in and pitch the bottom of the eighth. And Overbay fouls off the curve. Well, Evan Meek is now pitcher of record on the long side after working a 1 2 3 7. That's a lot of the top of the batting order coming up in the bottom of the eighth. Now as he's one two there goes McCutcheon and no throw. McCutcheon steals third running on his own. Neil Walker holding it first. Tenth stolen base of the year for McCutcheon. Well both teams Pittsburgh and the Mets not holding on the runner at all and you're saying to yourself why would you do that. Well it's more important right now with two outs that maintain your defensive position to how to win back and McCutcheon decided to steal third. Jason Bay did the same thing in the sixth inning, stole third base with two out when he was untested. With Dickey, it's a better play because of the threat of the pass ball or wild pitch. 2 2 to Overbay, and the curveball fouled at the plate. So Overbay able to keep himself alive with a couple of good curveballs. Kyle Overbay, 34 years old, the veteran in this otherwise very youthful Pirate lineup. Spent the last five years in Toronto after beginning his career in the National League with Arizona and Milwaukee. Seventh pitch of the at bat, and Overby fouls off the fastball. Well, I can really tell this fifth time in six games for Isringhausen. Uh, fastballs around 87, 88 miles an hour today. Trying to throw that cutter in on. Lyle Overbay has not been able to make the pitch yet. He's got good career numbers against Overbay, who's just one for ten against him. But he's in a battle here with first and third and two out. And Overbay lifts one to left, and Bay drifting back there to grab it. Bay retires Overbay, and the inning is over. The three-run score for the Pirates, and now the Pirate bullpen will try to make a two-run lead stand up.
Tonight, the last Pirates player to drive in 100 runs. Last Pirates player to drive in 100 runs. Well, I would I would think it's now a bat. Brandon Wood now playing third base for the Pirates. Taking over for defense, and Jose Veras will pitch the eighth inning for Pittsburgh. Well, Veras has had nine straight appearances without giving up an earned run. We saw him with the Marlins of recent, but before that, had a pretty pretty magical couple seasons with the Yankees, being a spot starter and reliever. Well, the Mets down two runs as they come to bat in the bottom of the eighth. The Mets twice on this homestand have lost games where they have the lead going to the eighth inning. Before this homestand, they had only one game all season in which they lost when they led after seven. Trying to avoid dropping a third such game on this homestand. Pagan is two for three, a single and a double. Fly deep to right his last time up, so he's two for three. And Angel hits the first pitch toward the bag at second, and Sedania with a nice pickup. One pitch and one out. So Pagan is retired, and now Justin Turner. Turner's hit three balls in the air tonight two fly balls to center and a pop up to short. Bobby Parnell, who got here during the late innings last night, is up in the Mets bullpen for the first time since coming off the disabled list. He was activated yesterday when Jose Reyes went on the bereavement list. The expectation on Reyes is that he will be back for Thursday's day game. So the Mets will have to make a player move at that time when he gets reactivated. Right now, the Mets are carrying 13 pitchers, including Parnell. And Turner muscles one to shallow center, and in comes McCutcheon to grab it. And there are two out. So four balls in the air from Justin Turner tonight. And he's gone over four. Interesting. Uh, McCutcheon playing very shallow there in center field. So two out of nobody on and now Carlos Beltran is one for three single to center his last time up. Well, the Pirates got outstanding starting pitching again tonight. James McDonald went six solid innings allowed just a run on six hits. And that's now 12 straight games for Pittsburgh starters allowing two earned runs or less. That's a pretty good formula for victory isn't it. It should be, but this one's not in the books yet, and they're six and five. Well, their offense has been pop gun at best. But so far, the Mets have yet to scratch against the Pittsburgh bullpen. Five up and five down against Meek and Veris. And the slider misses one and two to Beltron. Jason Bay would be next. And the slider in for a call third strike. Beltron down looking. Well, the Mets went meekly against Meek. And that was veracity from Veras.
This is the last pirate player to drive in 100 runs. We assume it's Jason Bay, right? That's what, um, my assumption. There you go. Sometimes it's like Occam's razor. The simplest answer is the best. There you go. Very nice. <laughs> Bobby Parnell for the first time in six weeks takes the mound for the Mets. Well, it's going to be interesting to see. Uh, you know, Bobby was down there uh, working on his uh, secondary pitches, but also was still having some numbness uh, at, at night occasionally. Uh, we talked about that the problems that put him on the disabled list. Garrett Jones leads off in the top of the ninth. Jones is 0 for 3 tonight. Pirates got all three of their runs in the eighth against R.A. Dickey, all coming with two out in the eighth, and there's a 95 mile an hour foul. Some pitchers live with a little yeah. numbness or coldness in their fingers. I know that Tom Glavin wrestled with that for most of his career. Something called uh, Raynaud's syndrome, where your fingers get cold even on hot days. And a call strike, nothing in two. My, uh, the, the only thing I ever suffer from when I would pitch would um, like the swelling of my fingers especially the tips of uh, forefinger and middle finger on the right hand would uh, it, be very painful for my I guess just ripping off the cords ripping off the seams. Well the word on Parnell down in Buffalo was that he was throwing his fastball 96 to 100 miles an hour. So even though. He was ostensibly there to work on his slider. It was his fastball yeah. that was thriving in his days on rehab. Two and two now to Jones with Sedano and Brown to follow for the Pirates, who have had only five hits today. But well, they had three of them in that eighth inning rally. Josh Harrison with his first big league RBI tying the game and then Neil Walker with a two out two run hit to put the Pirates in front. 99 from Parnell but off the plate and it's three and two. Joel Hanrahan has been perfect in save opportunities for the Pirates this year and he's getting ready to pitch the bottom of the ninth. Talking about guys that throw 96 plus. He was erratic when we saw him in Washington but he has become much more reliable. Hit in the air to right field. Beltron back. And right at the edge of the warning track to grab it. One away. Let's check in with the studio. Chris Carlin and Bobby O'Hee to have a preview of what's coming up tonight on Lincoln Post Game Live. Guys. All right, all that coming up right after the ball game. Right now, Ronnie Cedeno, who led off the eighth inning with a base hit against R.A. Dickey and came around to score the tying run. One for three on the night, and he takes a strike. Looking ahead to the bottom of the ninth, the Mets will have Bay, Murphy, and Evans do up against Joel Hanrahan trying to come from behind in the ninth hey, inning. We all right? Stop. Let it go. And Cedeno strolling away. A little upset with Doug Eddings, I think. Well, you know, when you're leading three to one and you get a pitch called against you, that's not what you think about. I mean, team's more important. Stay in there. You got two more strikes. That's why you saw Clint Hurdle on the top steps. He did not want to lose his shortstop. He was ready to pull the. Uh, the seals rescue. That's right. <laughs> he was going down the ladder. And there's the first slider from Parnell. One and two to Sedania. 89 miles an hour. He has always been for Bobby is down in the strike zone. It's where he's got his best movement. He's got a little thing he does with his front shoulder that he pulls in. It's one of the reasons he throws so hard. But when he pulls it too hard to first base. He opens up and that's when he gets flat. You would, his velocity on his fastball is certainly there. You would like in a perfect world for him to get that six foot four inch frame moving right through the catcher in a straight line. It'll help his control.
but I know what you're saying about his front shoulder. It kind of jerks to the left. That's one of the reasons he throws hard is because he's able to jerk that front shoulder really with a violent motion late right before he releases the baseball, but he'd serve better by keeping that in long. Now it's three and two to Sedania with Dusty Brown on deck. And a bouncer. Tejada to his left. Nice play, but a high throw, and off the bag comes Evans, and Sedania is safe. Well, Tejada went a long way to get that ball, but could not throw accurately. It's almost like the ball below his feet got him all tangled up and off balance, so he's never able to make the proper throw. Nice play by Nick Evans with some hops. They're going to score that an error. That's a tough error right there. So a one out base runner for the Pirates. And now Dusty Brown who's gone over three in his first game for Pittsburgh. Dusty Brown spent the entirety of his 10 years in professional baseball with the Red Sox organization. Before this year. Drafted in 2000 by Boston made his professional debut in 01. 15 at bats for the Red Sox but. Every game in his career in the Red Sox organization until this season. So it's, it's going to be culture shock, doesn't it? Well, he spent a few years uh, in one of your second homes, right? In Pawtucket. Mm -hmm. And uh, has to have one of the top five great baseball names right now in the big league. Dusty Brown's a good baseball name. He comes by it honestly. Dustin William Brown. There you go. I mean, a Dusty could be, could come from anything, That's right? right? You could be Johnny B. Baker and be Dusty. That's right. You think anybody ever called could be Dustin? Kicked. Anybody ever called Dustin Hoffman Dusty? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Hoffman. That's what he goes by. Unless he's playing a Fokker. Mr. Hoffman, here's your Oscars. Yeah. <laughs> Parnell stepping off. And Tolly will go out for a visit. One is a fastball, two is a slider. SNY is giving back to local youth baseball leagues with the SNY Play Ball Award presented by Sports Authority, offering $5,000 grants to in need organizations to be used for new equipment, uniforms, or field improvements. The deadline to apply June 15th. For details, visit SNY.tv or any local sports authority. Location. Now Parnell falls behind Brown 2 0. Xavier Paul, the only left handed bat on the Pirates bench, has come out on deck. And Brown takes a strike 2 and 1. Dusty Brown's first big league hit in 2009 was a home run. He's only had four major league hits. Wow. Must be a Boston thing. Well, no one will ever outdo Daniel oh, Nava. No. First pitch, bases loaded, grand slam. Only the second player in history to do that. Kuzminov? Kevin Kuzminov was the first. There goes the runner and a perfectly executed hit and run. As Brown has his first Pirates hit, Sedano pulls in at third, and the Pirates have runners at the corners with one out. So Terry Collins looking on as the Pirates try to expand on their two run lead. Dale Thayer gets up in the Mets bullpen as Xavier Paul is announced as the pinch hitter. Paul, who was picked up on waivers from the Dodgers. And you certainly have to consider the squeeze yes. play possibility here. Defensively, you can see the middle infielders are in. I don't know. I think I'd have to have them all in because uh, uh, Paul just has too much speed. 
And he squares to bunt, but not a suicide squeeze as Sedano wasn't coming. It looks like the safety squeeze that has been more and norm for Major League Baseball this season. What is that at home, folks? Uh, just the Paul's going to try to bunt for a base hit or put it in a place that Ronnie Sedano, with all that great speed, if he reads that it's going to be a difficult play for anyone to make, he's going to proceed home. And time asked for. And of course, the assumption is that, you know, once the hitter squares to bunt, that third baseman comes charging, and the runner from third can just follow the third baseman as far as he goes. Well, the tougher play is if he can bunt it to down the first baseline, because that's a backhand play for the pitcher. It takes the full cut and fouls it off. Evans is not going to get there because he's holding the runner on. Uh, if it's bunted to Murphy, you're hoping Murph can almost stay at least even or close to Sedano as they come in, and that the throw will get Sedano at the plate, but it's a tough play. Burdak, the left hander, joins Thayer, the right hander, in the Mets bullpen. Parnell trying to get himself out of trouble here in the ninth. First and third and one out. And Paul takes the backdoor slider just off the plate. One and two. I'll say Tabata waiting on deck. I think you almost have to count you here with a fastball in or up because the fastball away for Paul, too big of a hole between Murphy and Tejada. Now it's two and two. And Paul swings and misses at the slider, and Parnell has the strikeout he needs for the second out. Well, you talk about situational hitting all the time. Well, there's situational pitching also. Bobby knew he had to get a pop up or a strikeout in that situation, and he got it. So now two out of the inning, and it's left to Jose Tapita, who's had a good night at the plate. Led off the game by poking a double down the right field line. He walked in the third. He was robbed of a hit on a great play by Murphy in the sixth. And then he was right in the middle of the Pirates rally in the eighth inning when he got hit on the elbow by a pitch. So he's been on base three times, officially one for two. First and third and two out, and Tabata goes around on the half swing. Good slider by Parnell to start him off. Well, we've seen Tabata, you talked about it, Gary, his double in the first. Also hit a hard shot just fouled down the right field line. His theme tonight really has tr been trying to hit the ball the other way. And totally moves outside. Another slider, and it's one and one. Well, Parnell came out throwing bullets in this inning, but more and more has been mixing in the breaking ball and looking good doing it. Brandon Wood, who came on for defense in the last inning, is on deck. And three sliders in a row. That one at 91 miles an hour. And it's one and two to top of it. It's a John Smoltz slider. That's right. Hammerhan was watching, ready for his save chance. Barnett had one and two on top of it. Four sliders in a row. And it's two and two. Well, you find to bust them inside now? Well, I, I think that one of the things that Bobby can do, but he hasn't learned how to do it yet, is that pitch up in the strike zone, out of the strike zone, that fastball. Well, he stays away. And Parnell throws it low and away. Delayed steal attempt, and in safely is Dusty Brown. Timed that perfectly so that Tolley could never make a throw. So Dusty Brown has his first major league stolen base. Well, Mets weren't really prepared for that play right there. Tata was a little late. Tolley was a little late in recognizing what was going on. See the little delay, a little two, three steps. And honestly, if Bobby Parnell had been paying more attention, easy pickoff at first base. And now it's three and two. 
And Tabata takes it low for ball four. 100 miles an hour on the fastball after Parnell threw all those sliders. But now the bases are loaded with two out, and Brandon Wood coming up for the first time. Wood started last night at third base and went 0 for 3. Came on for defense, replacing Josh Harrison, who had a major league debut to remember tonight. Harrison picked up his first two major league hits and drove in the tying run. This guy right here, he doesn't care about 100, he cares about an out. 100 is good if it's a strike. <laughs> There's a strike at 98. By the way, that's outstanding telestrating. I am. <laughs> I'm like a vitamin. What a day. Hey, at least it worked. <laughs> one and one now. Andrew McCutcheon would be next. Barnell about to throw his 30th pitch in this inning. And Wood pulls it just foul. Nice hop, skip, and a jump by Ronnie Sedano to get out of the way. You know what's interesting about that slider? That was the first real bad slider that Bobby threw. Is that the differential between his fastball and slider is not much. So it's almost easier for the hitters to react. No change of speed really. Everything hard. One and two to the former Angel, Brandon Wood. And the fastball away at 99. Two and two. Well, with those lines erased at the end of the game, Wood is getting as much as he can. And that looks like he's out of the box, but who would know? Delta keep climbing overhead cam. Pitch of decision here for Parnell on two and two, and he gets him to lift it to shallow center. Long run for Pagan, and it drops for a hit. So Daniel and Brown score. On to third goes Tabata. A two run single for Brandon Wood, and the Pirates stretch their lead to five to one. So Bobby Parnell's return to the major leagues after a six week absence has not gone well. well. Another slider on the outside part. Plenty of sliders for these buck hitters to see. And Wood, yes, is that a lucky hit? Well, maybe it is, but he got a piece of the ball on a tough two pitch strike. And sometimes you're rewarded, and Brandon was. The runs will be unearned, the result of the Tejada error, but that's no comfort for Parnell, who takes his exit. Dale Thayer will come on. It's now 5 to 1, Pittsburgh.
Dale Thayer makes a second appearance for the Mets and his first pitch fastball fouled off by Andrew McCutcheon. Well here's how not to win friends and influence people. Look that is <laughs> oops. Who wrote that book Dale Carnegie. I don't think they read it. <laughs> Made his Mets debut Saturday night. And gave up a run against the Phillies throwing 18 consecutive fastballs and he's thrown two fastballs to start off McCutcheon. There was having a terrific year at Buffalo when the Mets called him up. And McCutcheon pops one up. Just Dustin uh, Justin Turner retreating to make the grab and that retires the side. But the Pirates tack on two and send it to the bottom of the ninth five to one bucks. Paul stays in the game as a new right fielder for the Pirates who look to close out the Mets 5 1 here in the ninth. Joel Hanrahan has been outstanding this year on now. 14 for 14 in save opportunities. This one, though, not a save chance with a four run lead. And Hanrahan had his struggles in Washington and they didn't really figure it out until he came over to Pittsburgh and has gotten better and better and better. And I asked him why. And he said, Well, the last days when I was in Washington, uh, we were playing a series against the Pirates, and a couple of friends of mine, Andy LaRoche and Delwyn Young, came up to me said you know you have absolutely zero swag and zero confidence on the mouth and he said really it was just he said so stunning to hear it from friends but also the opposition the hitters that I faced them to tell me that was really an eye opener shortly after I was sent to the Pirates and I really looked at that and, and worked on that and I think that really helped you know just having the confidence out there in myself on the mound. I think that was part of the transformation guys well they pitched well for the Pirates last year in uh, 72 games and got some safe chances along the way but his first time as a full time closer this year he's been splendid. Well he went with the uh, King Tut kind of facial hair from the Batman series maybe that's going to make him a little more menacing. Bay drives one at deep left field Tom but got turned around but he finds it and makes the grab. Quite a route by Jose Tabata but somehow he was able to locate the ball. He spun like a ballerina. Well that ball always usually has some top spin when Bay hits it and then ends up with a fancy basket catch nice athletic play by Tabata even though he was fooled. So one out of the last of the ninth and Daniel Murphy comes up Murphy's two for three today. Eight hits in his last three games. And with that he's raised his average to 286. Well the Mets have not hit a home run tonight. They have gone nine straight games before tonight without a home run. 
The last time the Mets went 10 straight games without a home run. 1980. 31 years ago when they set a club record going 17 straight games without a home run. 1980 also known as the dark ages. Well I'll have, in to, Mets history. I'll have to remember to miss that yearbook. I'll have to ask uh, Mookie about that. He would have been around that. That's right. Huby Brooks. Kelvin Chapman. Two and two to Murph. Geico Sports Night, your nightly source for all things New York sports tonight. A uh, little tete a tete in the football world. Look around the NL East in Miami and Dallas, get things started in the NBA Finals. Geico Sports Night tonight after the postgame on SNY. And a swing and a miss. Slider from Hanrahan strikes out Murphy. And the Mets are down to their final out. Well, the Pirate bullpen has been terrific tonight. Well, you mentioned Kevin mentioned 14 to 14 saves. 2008, Hanrahan had nine saves with the Nationals, and has moved over to Pittsburgh. Has been much better. Well, Evan Meek pitched a one two three seventh. Jose Veras a one two three eighth. And now two out and nobody on in the ninth for Hanrahan as Nick Evans. Lines one foul. Evans has walked and struck out twice tonight, so looking for his first major league hit of the season. Now we've talked about the Mets bullpen ad nauseum, but really it's the offense against the opponent's bullpen that's been kind of a, uh, a problem for the Mets. 17 straight they went down in the Philadelphia series and working on what, nine tonight? Eight? And a call strike to Evans. Well, Ari Dickey was unbelievable for the first seven innings, pitching with the torn plantar fascia in his foot. But it came apart with two out in the eighth, and that cost him. Now the 0-2, and Evans goes down swinging. Hanrahan with a 1-2-3 ninth to finish off the Pirates' victory. The last 10 Mets went down in order, and the Pirates even up the series at a game apiece as for the third time on this homestand, the Mets lose a game that they led after seven innings. Well, you have to give a lot of credit to the Pirates and James McDonald, their starter, who stuck in there. Uh, with R.A. Dickey, their bullpen was outstanding for Clint Hurdle today, and even more importantly, R.A. Dickey now magical year last year, now 0 and 5 at home this year. The last time that happened, Anthony Young and Pete Shore in 1993. Well, Clint Hurdle's team hung in there long enough after Dickey allowed just two hits and struck out 10 over the first seven innings, but the eighth was his undoing as the Pirates rally for two in the ninth after three in the eighth and pull away to a five to one victory to get this series even there's your New York Community Bank's game summary we'll come back with much more from City Field in just a moment.